in the last few years, I've been going around the world and trying to talk to people about open science. Um, and some of it has to do with this um, big project that we've been doing uh, for two years or so since I uh, moved back here to Hong Kong and joined the University of Hong Kong. And uh, now this, uh, this month, this week, uh, it's, it's kind of a celebration for us in these dark times where we're about to complete uh, 100 of these uh, pre-registered replications and extensions. And uh, in, in, in this presentation, I'll try and, and share uh, a little bit of that uh, with you. Uh, typically, what I do is that I present uh, the open uh, science movement, I present the credibility revolution, what is the replication reproducibility crisis, and so forth. But I kind of know the people in Kent, at least through Twitter and some interactions online, and I think most of you are familiar with this. So I I'm going to assume that people know what these things are. And I'm just going to say that if you want to know more about this, let's say that you're not familiar, um, then there are some talks on YouTube where I discuss these things. So you can do a 30 minute presentation or an hour and a half presentation, or there's like a whole course that's now on YouTube that you can go and learn about uh, these things. Plus I'll mention this later, but uh, the, <laughs> the students, uh, here at University of Hong Kong wrote a book about this. It's a 200 page book, um, collaborative, Google Doc, everybody working together about what is this credibility revolution. But briefly, my argument is uh, that a credibility revolution is needed. At the very least, we need to reassess uh, what our situation is. So regardless of where you are in the spectrum of does it exist or not, uh, the very least, we need to, to know where we are uh, with this. And um, once we kind of understand that we need to do uh, this, um, I would argue that there's always room for improvement on how we do uh, research. Lots of directions uh, in that. And I think the Open Science Movement has helped us figure out some of these uh, things. Uh, but this is not, this is like a good beginning, but some of it, it also affects the way that we uh, teach. So I'm a third year assistant professor at University of Hong Kong. And when I came here two, three years ago after a postdoc in the Netherlands, I needed to decide what to do with this, uh, you know, the books in the courses and everything that people gave me, like, this is how you should teach. And I was looking at all of these and thinking to myself, this is, this is not something I can do given everything that is going on. So once I decided that I, I need to change the way that we teach uh, here at University of Hong Kong, I came to kind, kind of some principles and decided that uh, we must work together uh, in order to address this crisis, in order to change the way that we teach. So we're going to do this in a very collaborative way, and I'll be, uh, describe some of this. Uh, and then uh, focusing on the students as the solution for the current uh, crisis. If it's just going to be you and I, uh, scholars, assistant professors, uh, and, and above, it's gonna take a very long time for us to figure out what's going on and, and correct this. Students can help us uh, address this uh, crisis and assess the way that we do uh, research. So instead of, of going open science, credibility revolution and all this, and then coming to a project, I'm going to start with the project. Uh, I think it's the first time that I'm doing it this way, so I'm gonna describe first who we are and what we've done so far. Uh, and there's an open invitation in there for you. And I'll describe what this invitation entails and, and what it means uh, to, to join us with this sort of thing. After I present that, only then I will go into the motivation and the process about like, how uh, did we do this? Uh, why did we do this? And then finally, at the end, I will give some uh, suggestions on how you can do it uh, on your own. So uh, everything that we do, you can take uh, and implement this in your own courses or in your own universities. Uh, or if you want to kind of first get, get your hands dirty and learn what this means, many opportunities for you to, to join us uh, on these, on these um, uh, projects. So we'll start with who we are. 
I did not imagine it will grow uh, this fast, um, but it did. So at the beginning, it was just like me by myself in my little bubble here at University of Hong Kong, working with some TAs and, uh, and some students. So at the beginning, it started here in Hong Kong. So some colleagues are kind of like, we heard that you're doing this sort of thing, or the students would come after taking my course, they would go to their labs and say, you know, you, we learned this, what's happening here in this lab. So the beginning, it started in, in Hong Kong with a group of, of people. But um, as I attended the SIPS, the Society for Improvement uh, um, Psychological Science, um, um, so more, more and more people became aware of this. And then I decided that I'm going to break out of my bubble and invite as many people as possible uh, in, in it. And then uh, UK is actually, we, we have quite a few collaborators from over there, Netherlands, uh, my old home, uh, some people from the uh, United States and, and Israel. So it's it's kind of, it's growing. And if you uh, seen me uh, post things on Twitter, so like I, I post a lot about an invitation for people to come in and there's very few uh, limitations of what it means to come and join us. So it's nice to see that this is, that this is growing and it's no longer tied to me. So uh, many of these scholars like are working with each other uh, without me in the middle. So the beginning, I kind of like was a connecting point, the, the manager for this sort of thing. But now it's kind of it has a life of its own. It's a bit, a bit like a, a small community of early career researchers that are working uh, together and helping one another do open science and run replications. Uh, here you can see very briefly, as uh, you know, the names. Uh, but what I wanted you to really see is this point over here is that uh, after three years of running this, I had uh, more than 300 students, undergraduate students, um, under my guidance in all of these courses that I taught, taking part in doing replications. So that's a, a massive undertaking. And I wouldn't be able to do this without uh, amazing teaching assistants. Uh, and then I have my guided uh, thesis students that you can see their names here. So I guide, uh, most of them are undergraduates, but we're also, also masters. Uh, but this is taught masters, it's not research masters. So all of these have very little uh, to no research background whatsoever. So they come into the course, maybe they ran a t-test at best, you know, uh, introduction to statistics and all this. But from the beginning of the semester, knowing almost nothing about statistics and science to the end of one semester, they're able to complete a replication and extension uh, including data collection, including writing a, a APA style submission ready manuscript and all that. So it's uh, a lot of people have uh, gone uh, through this. So I'll start from the end. Uh, what is the summary of what we've done so far? So this week uh, we have these uh, 13 registered reports and eight pre-registered uh, finalizing and I'll show you some of that. So I haven't included uh, that in here yet, but what we already have completed are 72 pre-registered replications and extension projects. Um, it did not cost us as much as I feared it, it would because we run almost everything on Amazon Mechanical Turk and Prolific Academic. Um, I'll show you exactly how, how that works uh, with some samples at least at the beginning in order to see that these are reliable and uh, maybe cultural differences. We also ran this with Hong Kong undergrads and uh, at least in judgment decision-making, it seems like Things are very consistent across the, the samples. Uh, so Hong Kong, um, uh, mostly British on, on prolific, and uh, I restrict this to American on, on MTurk, seem to show some consistent, very consistent uh, uh, results. And if you, I'll talk a little bit later about uh, what is the situation right now with the replicability rate, um, the, the success rate that we have is about 70%, 60, 68%, uh, with a lot of um, uh, mixed and inconclusive and some that are unsuccessful. Um, but I want you to really think about this uh, figure for a bit, because if we look at uh, the situation in, let's say, social psychology with some of the mass replications, many labs and the uh, open science collaboration and all that, the rate is somewhere between 30 and 50. Um, but when we look at this rate here, at least it seems that in the judgment decision-making domain that we focus on here, uh, the replication rate is higher. But 
putting the judgment and decision-making uh, domain aside, I want you to think about what, what this means in terms of who ran this. So at the beginning of the project, when I told people, um, so I'm this first year assistant professor, I'm thinking of running uh, these replications with undergraduates. Uh, they're from Hong Kong. So, you know, they're uh, from 18 to 20 years old, uh, no background. And we're going to run this on Amazon Mechanical Turk and Prolific. Uh, people were very um, skeptical to the point of hostile. And most of the reactions are, uh, this is never going to work. So it's not just that this is, goes to show that judgment and decision-making uh, artistic classics uh, replicate fairly well, but also goes to show that you can do real science with high replication rate with uh, undergraduates in places like uh, Hong Kong with almost no background in statistics and science. Even with the mixed and inconclusive, it's quite remarkable what these students were able to achieve. Many times these students were able, just by trying to reproduce the materials, they were able to see misalignment between the table, the figures and the text. They were able to see some errors, some very apparent errors that nobody has noticed since the classics in the 1970s, which really makes you wonder um, like what happened during these years. Has nobody ever tried to, to reproduce these things? Um, and then in almost all of these, they were able to uh, design some extensions or uh, lead to some insights that would allow us to uh, look at this uh, further and uh, suggest directions uh, for, for the future. So I'll give you an example from last semester. So in last semester, the way that we ran this is, for example, we had uh, 11 uh, teams. In each team, we have two groups of two students. Um, and we ran 11 of, of these. So for example, group one would have their uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk Americans, and then group two would run their, uh, the, same, the same target article uh, in both. Uh, they would run this with the uh, British Prolific Academic. Um, and then at the end, we have its complete, completed manuscript with uh, you know, all the data collection analyzed and written up. And then uh, two extensions in each one of these teams. So each one uh, not only does the replication, but also needs to do uh, extensions. And we have a guide on how to do extensions. We have three types of extensions, uh, either an individual differences scale at the beginning or adding some condition to the IV or adding a different DV after the replication is, is done. You go to the next stage and then there's an additional uh, DV. So, um, all this is just like a very uh, comprehensive way of looking at uh, one specific uh, target uh, article. The only reason I was able to do this, uh, this uh, all, all these uh, you know, very high power, uh, two samples and all that is because uh, this is the only time that we got any funding uh, from the teaching development grant. So research did not want to fund us. <laughs> because it's replications, but the teaching side wanted to fund us because it was a good a way to train students. So they gave us some money and we were able to use that uh, for this. I'm just gonna describe what our process is like, just so you understand what the students need to do. So uh, that semester, um, they start from looking at, you know, designing the call checks. So they look at the article, they analyze everything that goes on in there. They structure this in a certain table. They look at, so what is the IV? What are the conditions? What are the DVs? What are the scales? So just reproduce from the very little detail in the articles, what would the, uh, the experiment look like? And we have a, a side license for Quadrix. So this is the easiest for us. And it's very easy to train uh, students uh, with that. So they, they do the, the Quadrix. And then Quadrix has this feature where it generates a, a random data set. Um, so based on whatever design you have, you can just like uh, randomly uh, generate uh, a thousand, let's say, um, participants. And then they write data analysis code. Uh, we do this with Jamovi. So uh, I'm very glad that now Jamovi is very stable and uh, a lot of people are using this. Three years ago, this was not the case, but we were working together with the Jamovi folks to uh, uh, enter, you know, insert some, some functionality that we had. So it was a really nice uh, experience where we kind of gambled on Jamovi and it really paid off. And it was also kind of a gateway to uh, get them to use R. So um, they do the net data analysis code and then they write a pre-registration report. Uh, back then, um, uh, at the beginning, it was just a regular uh, registration report uh, from Roger from JSP. So, <laughs> 
um, uh, we use that format and they kind of follow that. Then uh, we did peer review. So uh, as I said, they, we have two groups. So they peer review one another. So they have the same target. They analyze this independently. They peer review one another. Then I go on Twitter. I think every semester you can see me going on Twitter and say, who wants to help us? And then people come in and sign in as, as external uh, reviewers. They give some feedback. Then the students have one week to revise. And finally, once they submit the, uh, the revise, I have very difficult two, three weeks where I need to go over all of these, uh, verify that they're okay and everything is good. I go on the open science framework. I pre-register everything and I conduct the uh, data collection on Amazon, Mechanical Turk, or Prolific. Then I give them the data sets. Uh, once again, they analyze everything. Uh, they, write, they write it up as an APA submission uh, manuscript, uh, peer review one another, external people coming. And then finally, they have one week to revise. So all this is one, one semester. This is how this uh, thing works. Um, and finally, at the end, we have uh, their, their ready submission. So ideally, at the end, we should be able to just send this off to, uh, to a journal. Uh, we don't. We invite early career researchers to come in, take the lead, verify everything, make sure that the student did a, a decent job. So uh, they do peer review on each other. Then we have the teaching assistants. Then there's external feedback. Then there's me. And at the end, there's the invited early career researchers. So if there's some error or something doesn't make a lot of sense, then somebody should be able to catch this. And of course, the biggest test for this is that we submit this to the journal, uh, there are reviewers, everything is on the open science framework, everything is shared. So uh, if there is something that went wrong in this because they're students, because they're untrained, we should be able to, to find that error. So checks and balances, I think, are a key ingredient here in this uh, process. Uh, if you uh, would like, I can just like show you, you're welcome to uh, scan this. I'm gonna uh, click this, uh, click this, and, and show you just a little bit of. Um, so I'll just like open this for a second. Uh, you can go and uh, look at this uh, yourselves. Uh, but I just want to show you just how everything is, uh, how open everything is. So uh, let's say from this project, everything is an Airtable. So for example, these are our targets. You can see Group A and Group B. You have the link to the original publication. You have the pre-registration with the OSF. Uh, you can see Amazon Mechanical Turk, American or Prolific Academic. You see the sample size. So the sample sizes are quite large. And then everything is on those uh, Dropbox uh, or organized for uh, whoever is interested to come in and have a look with the Jamovi files, with the pre-registrations, with the uh, raw data and the analyzed data. So everything is in there just uh, ready for uh, people to come in, have a look, uh, collaborate, take, take over this, and just continue in order to bring this to uh, submission. Um, just, you know, at the beginning, when I told people I'm going to do this, people were very skeptical. But after we ran this for a couple of semesters, I went back to the original authors, uh, which, uh, you know, some of them were skeptical. And then I showed them, and it's quite remarkable to see, this is like a quote from one of the, the emails, is uh, uh, they, were, they were quite impressed with this, uh, these things. And I like their, their, their summary. It's like, they're truly amazed by the quality of the work. I don't think our first year PhD students at business school can do anything like that. You must have given them a lot of guidance. Um, first of all, I like the idea that, uh, you know, uh, they should seriously consider asking their PhD students to do the same. First of all, I want to say not only PhD students, so these are undergraduate students, undergraduate students can do this sort of thing. Second of all, I did not give them a lot of guidance. I gave them very little guidance at the beginning. Uh, they figured things out on their own. It's quite amazing actually to see how well the students do. If you just like, uh, you show them the general direction, you tell them what the, the end goal should be, you give them some examples, templates and resources, and they were able to figure this out. So uh, I give all the credit to the students. And I think that we can do this not only with our PhD students, but I guess PhD students or maybe guided thesis students are a good start. What did we do? What's ending this week? What is ending this week is that this, this semester I did not have funding. So I couldn't run a data collection, but uh, it already bothered me before that uh, I, I think uh, some of the editors uh, that looked at our manuscripts are actually here. Uh, so 
when we submit this to the journals, there's lots of stuff that goes on with the reviewers in terms of uh, outcome bias, hindsight bias. People still don't know how to look at the replication. I really think the right way to do replication is with registered reports. So before you do your data collection, you submit this uh, plan, the pre-registration plan for review at a journal. So I'd use this opportunity of, of not having funding in order to get the students to write a registered report stage one. So we did a very similar format, uh, 13 teams. And then once again, they do uh, their extensions. You can see it's very, very similar um, uh, with some pre-testing uh, but we still, we're going to submit, uh, you know, before I pre-register and before I con conduct the data collection, we're going to submit um, the, uh, this to the journals to get some peer review. Uh, so it will be interesting to compare what happens when we submit a completed pre-registered replications versus what happens when we submit a registered report. I can say that we've pre-tested registered reports this year on three uh, different projects. And it was overwhelmingly uh, positive. So uh, none of the sarcastic, uh, hostile uh, reviewers that sometimes we get, not, nothing about you know, novelty or contribution. It was all very constructive, positive. So I'm optimistic about register report as a, a solution uh, to this. I'm, I'm quite interested to see what, what's gonna happen with our um, with our project. So if you want to have a look at this, this is from this morning. So they submitted this last night. Uh, so if you want to see what, what they've done, you're very welcome to uh, uh, look at this. I just want to show you like how comprehensive this is and what these uh, sweet students are doing. So I'll open this for a second. The courses and the presentations, they have the final submissions and this is what I shared with you. So for example, over here, you can just like go in here. We, we did both replications and extensions. And we did uh, guides, primers, or opinion piece. Um, and then you can see that for each one of these, for example, inside, oh, this is for the opinion piece. I'll show you one of the replications and extensions. So for example, over here, you have group A, you have group B. Uh, you can see for them, you can see the manuscript, the supplementary, you can see the call checks, uh, you can see the data sets and the code, the raw data, and then the analyzed data for the two uh, replicated studies in that uh, target. And then they did, they did a nice, a nice presentation where they introduce, uh, they introduce. Hi, uh, our group today will present to you our replication and extension on Kohler and Gershoff betrayal and versus Yusa betrayers. So, uh, as you can see, it's like uh, it's very compre comprehensive and a lot of things in there um, where students really have to not only struggle with uh, doing the replication and extensions and writing manuscripts, but also communicating this uh, to others. So that even if this doesn't get published, let's say as a manuscript, at, very, at the very least it's gonna be like in the OSF with clear presentations, all the materials. So uh, we should be able to solve something about, you know, the loss of materials for those target articles and encourage other replications for other people to, uh, to follow. Uh, this is like for the external, external reviewers that I recruited on, on Twitter. Um, so that they were very happy to come in, in, and join. And it's quite amazing, you know, uh, that people on Twitter are, are willing to come in and especially, you know, pandemic, Corona, uh, to come in and contribute from their own time in order to go over the students. And then the feedback that they get is, uh, they give is very enthusiastic. So it's very, very nice to see the engagement between the external reviewers uh, and the students. So even if you don't feel like you want to take a lead over one of these projects, you just want to work with some of the students or see how they do their stuff. There's like a lot of, of possibilities for you to do that. Uh, it's been a productive year for this project. So as you can see, our model is that we invite uh, early career researchers. This is like the publications that we have from this project uh, this year. So for example, over here, Ignacio, um, um, has done well this year by taking our students' uh, projects. So you can see all the un underlined are uh, our students, and this is my teaching assistant. So you can see everybody is a co-author on this. So there's the lead uh, early career researcher. Um, the star here indicates that it's a shared co-authorship with the students. And then finally, uh, Mitch Failing uh, at the end. And um, so, uh, you know, for example, 
Uh, we've done very well with meta psychology and uh, even surprising journals like Journal of Economic Psychology, suddenly economics is publishing uh, replications. So that's, that's nice to see. Uh, we've had all sorts of like mixed results with some of the journals like uh, um, SPPS, some very positive, enthusiastic, and some of them quite hostile. Similar thing with the JSP, it's like with some of them very smooth, great, and some editors, I don't know uh, what's going on. But overall, I would say I'm surprised how well this, uh, this went out. Like three years ago, I did not think it would go this, uh, this far. At the beginning, I, uh, I really thought that we we're going to do a lot of preprints, and we do have a lot of preprints. So for us, the publication is, is a bonus. I would be very happy just with the preprints, but then I, I saw this as an opportunity to help open science early career researchers. Uh, the job market is, is hostile <laughs> right now. Not a lot of opportunities, especially for open uh, science researchers. So I see this as an opportunity for them to have like a lead uh, author, uh, open science, uh, high quality, large samples in, in good journals. So we, we try and, and so far it seems, it seems like it's going, it's going well. So preprints are our main goal. If we can bring this to a journal submission with uh, recruited early career researchers, that's terrific. So this is where, this is where the, the invitation is uh, for you. It doesn't necessarily have, let's say you're not an early career researcher, but let's say you have a lab or you're working with uh, students. Uh, we, we're happy to have both of you. So we have um, uh, like collaborations where the early career researcher is the lead author. And then let's say he's part of a lab where he has a mentor or an advisor and the advisor also joins. So there's lots of ways to do this sort of thing. But basically what we say is, we completed 72 of these. By the end of the, the year, the academic year, we're gonna have a hundred of these. Uh, all of these are you know, completed submissions. They're ready to be submitted. They need to be verified. They need to be uh, looked at. They need to be integrated in all sorts of uh, things, but these are completed manuscripts. So very, very low risk for early career researchers. And it's an opportunity for them to uh, get their hands dirty, perhaps for the first time in doing replications or doing uh, open science. So if you know an early career researcher who is interested in open science, who's interested in applications, who perhaps is familiar with judgment decision making, we're very happy to, uh, to work with them. We have, you know, starting from masters all the way to assistant professors. Um, so everything is possible. And from now until the end, you know, if you have any, um, any questions about this invitation, we have a very long guide on what it means, what is the collaboration, what is the you know, co-authorship and, and everything. But um, right now we have uh, quite, quite a team, um, about 30 of these early career researchers. Uh, but not only, or not only replication and extension and manuscripts. So I think one of the um, unintended side effects of this project, which I'm very happy about, is that not only are we doing open science, we are also doing meta science. So let's say, for example, Roger's uh, uh, template for doing pre-registrations. I think we first, like we use that. We have a lot of experience on how to use that. And then we improved it and we built templates for register reports, how to do that for the main manuscript, for the supplementary, for how to do the coding um, because they do peer review on one another, how to do a peer review. How do you train a student that is second year undergraduate to understand the concept of peer, re peer review and make sure that they that they really check each other uh, well. So these templates are very, very detailed. Uh, and I was very surprised that there were no templates uh, available. So we integrated a lot of different resources and we build these sort of things. And we're going to submit all of these templates and all of these, um, you know, the guides, everything that we built out to you know, a AMPPS or meta psychology or whoever is willing to publish these sort of things, by now they're very, very detailed. The nice thing is that all of these are Google Docs and they're collaborative. So let's say that you uh, want to um, implement this, of course you can go and you can use this, but more than that, if you contribute something, anything, in the spirit of SIPS, uh, the Society for Improvement of, of uh, you know, Psychological Science, uh, if you contribute something, you're a co-author. So when we submit this, it's like uh, it's a good opportunity. Not You don't even need to have a very substantial contribution. 
just something that is meaningful and kind of pushes us uh, forward. It could be just like verifying sort of things. But by now we have about 12 of these uh, templates. We have uh, 15 of these guides. So all of them were hoping to kind of uh, boost the community in terms of um, setting high standards for what it means to run replications, do open science, uh, even things about like, uh, for example, you know, how to do an extension. So um, we, we uh, struggled with how do you explain to a student how to take a replication and do an extension that will not uh, change the replication itself. How to calculate effect sizes and confidence intervals. So you have, I don't know, 50 different packages in R. You have a lot of ways to calculate this. How to do a power analysis, G power, and then the other tools. So how to take them step by step. Not only do we have guides and templates, but we also have very detailed uh, YouTube videos. And I give a lot of workshops. If Kent at some point will want me to come in and give a workshop, either on applications extensions or any one of these things, or maybe a meta-analysis, I'm very happy to do this. Uh, when the world is open, I usually go around the world and, and do this in person, but we are, we're happy to, to do this uh, by Zoom. If you want to join some of the stuff that we're already doing in the next two months, we're going to run Zoom workshops on uh, both register reports and meta-analysis. Uh, we also started doing uh, some uh, prediction markets. So the folks in uh, Stockholm, the economists uh, contacted me. And in the last uh, two years, we've been running prediction markets on our replications. So that's another meta, meta science direction of can people predict this sort of thing? Uh, you know, battling the people versus uh, machines who gets to predict uh, things better. So it's very interesting. And I ran things on Twitter and it seems like uh, the trade prediction markets and the Twitter prediction markets uh, surprisingly are aligned with one another. So maybe you don't need to you know, go through all the elaborate uh, stuff. So this is kind of like, uh, I, I think I'm running out of time, but this was like a good introduction of, of like uh, all, all the things of who we are and what we're about. The motivation in the process, I think most of this you're familiar with, so I'm gonna just like go through this. Uh, I present all of this to the students. So all of the course surrounds the replication crisis and I introduce this to the students. So now you can go on YouTube and see what, what the presentations uh, entail. But we discuss these findings and we explain uh, these sort of things. Uh, ego depletion is something that's so close to my heart because I, I exchanged to, to that lab. 2013, so uh, you know, heartbreaking stuff, discussing what is going on, uh, explaining what the implications are and inviting the students to go with me on a journey rather than me telling them this is the truth, let's figure this out together. By doing replications, we're able to see which of the classics in judgment decision-making uh, really, really hold. So I like this uh, uh, summary, it's a Twitter screen uh, capture from Brian Osik about 50 percent, and I want you to kind of contrast this to the about 70 percent in judgment decision making. And I think also this is kind of uh, like rather optimistic, given everything that came out in perspectives and AMPPS. It's like we're somewhere between 30 and 50 percent in uh, psychology. Some things we know are especially bad. Uh, let's say social priming, embodiment. Uh, you know, we, we have some difficulties over there, but generally it seems that. Our mass replication of judgment decision making and uh, in the journal judgment and decision making, Andreas uh, was running replications of what they published over there. They have a very similar rate, 60 to 70 percent. Uh, the experimental philosophers have uh, about a 70 percent. So it seems like at least with the simplified scenarios, um, uh, with the with the classics, you know, the stuff that that gets uh, cited a lot, there's fairly higher. Um, uh, replicability uh, rates. Uh, I also explained to them that this is not a psychology uh, problem. So some places where I went, so my, my uh, earlier this year, I got stuck in, in Brazil because I was uh, talking to the reproducibility initiative over there in, in biology. Um, so um, I thought at the beginning that I'm going to be very psychology focused, but when you do open science, when you do meta science, a lot of the things that you do are can be applied to other disciplines. So if you do an effect size uh, confidence intervals guide, it doesn't only serve psychology, it serves the other. If you do a good template, 
for how to uh, do a register report, let's say for a meta-analysis. Other people are very interested in this. So suddenly I'm collaborating with people from all across uh, the sciences and you can join us on this. So for example, uh, I guess you're familiar with cancer biology. So uh, a lot of ways in which psychology and our uh, very little project here in Hong Kong can contribute to uh, all these amazing projects in order to help uh, other disciplines uh, do better. My summary generally of the, the situation, uh, sometimes when I give talks in, in different places in the world, uh, especially in domains that are not psychology, people push back very hard. But my summary is, is that I'm convinced we're in a crisis. At least we need to reassess where we are uh, and we need to improve the way that we do research. But it's okay if people are not, as long as at least we know what's happening in the field and we understand the, all these findings that are coming out, you know, all these uh, mass replication projects in the different uh, disciplines. Now, if, if you want to uh, know more, um, Stuart Ritchie this year came out with the first book uh, that I'm familiar with. There was Chris Chambers at the beginning, Seven Scenes of uh, Psychology, but then Stuart Ritchie came out this, this year with a good uh, co cover of uh, the replication crisis. Uh, but a year ago, we didn't have that. So I asked the students to write this and we separated this into 13 different chapters and uh, groups of six students worked on each chapter. And now we have this, uh, this book about the replication crisis. So if you want to teach this, you're welcome to take this. Unlike Stuart, uh, I guess it's like paid and uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, ready for dissemination for students, but this perhaps is. And using SIPs, uh, group in SIPs that is, uh, you know, and fourth that want to um, help students learn about the replication crisis and credibility revolution, uh, we're hoping to make this into like a solid, a solid guide for this. These are my principles. I won't go into this. I think we all share this, uh, these directions. Uh, uh, but even if you don't agree uh, that something is going on, like nothing, not, nothing can be. Uh, wrong by just improving the way that we do research. I don't see how increased transparency can hurt anybody or data sharing. If anything, it increases uh, credibility. Um, okay, I'm gonna go over my, um, just gonna skip this. The main insights for me and the reason why I did this whole project is because I decided that if it will only be me and a guided thesis student, we're never gonna solve this. So in University of Hong Kong, I'm going to try and mass mobilize uh, the students. I interviewed for a few you know, job talks when I was looking for an assistant professor position. And it was incredible how difficult it is to find uh, somebody that would let me uh, do this in courses. And credit to University of Hong Kong, they allowed me to change everything. Even if they don't agree with me, and a lot of the leadership does not, does not agree uh, um, with some of the, you know, our claims, uh, they at least allowed me to try things out, proof of concept. And once we've shown after a year that this is possible, uh, they've given me a lot of support. So now in University of Hong Kong, uh, this, this course is happening. So um, it's amazing that they let me try this and just change everything. Uh, let me do my own thing. Uh, everything that we did is based on these amazing psychological science accelerator and CREP projects. I also took uh, some ideas from, you know, teaching applications in 2012 in perspectives. And then I really believe in this message that students are the answer to psychology's replication uh, crisis. I also took some stuff from uh, Sanjay over here in my syllabus. You're very welcome to uh, go and have a look at my syllabus. I believe in these principles. So no longer these books where every other page there's something that we don't know if it's uh, reliable or not. Uh, there's no more instructor truth where I show them, you know, in a PowerPoint, you know, this is the truth. Hear me. I'm the great professor. Uh, we can't we can't do that anymore. We really need to work uh, with the students. So uh, students will do actual science with real impact. They will go through the scientific process of peer review and they will use the latest uh, tools and, and, and trends. And I will learn uh, from them. Uh, open science principles uh, throughout. If you want to know more about this, now everything is on YouTube. Everything is on my website. You can, everything is also shared on the open science framework. So all these are uh, links that you can click and, and have a look. You're welcome to take this as is. You don't even need to you know, give me credit. It's just like, use this if you want to share back. That's terrific. 
But I really feel like not only should we have open science in terms of research, but I really feel like we need to help each other with teaching. Uh, so why not learn from what we've already uh, accomplished over here? And we're happy to learn from you if you do something uh, similar. Not only are we doing these replications and extensions and primers and all that, but we're also uh, trying to do some meta science in assessing how good our science is. So the students, we, uh, we have a template for this, do assessment of how good first the original article is and then how good the uh, replication is. So all these RRRs that came out in perspectives on the many labs, uh, the students went and analyzed. They actually tried to run um, the code. They uh, went step by step in order to see was this uh, reproduced well or not and they gave uh, scores. So I feel like we can structure the way that we assess science. Now in you know, Twitter, we have a few preprints about the red teams. How do you get red teams to, uh, you know, you pay them some money. Now there's a market for this. I just get the students to do this. And I think it's amazing training. So before they do the replications and extensions, I get them to assess completed replications and extensions, learn from the mistakes of others, uh, inform one another, and then, uh, try to do their own replications and extensions. So by doing assessments, first we're helping the field, and then in addition, we're also uh, um, you know giving 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 ourselves some training in order to do replications and, and extensions in a more uh, you know higher quality. So uh, you're welcome to uh, click on this and have a look at what they've done. Every semester we do different targets. This semester they assessed what we did. Uh, last year to see if uh, we can improve. So we're not only uh, like evaluating others, but we're also evaluating ourselves. So a lot of things going on over there. I'm gonna sum up with uh, community and collaboration, how you can do it and then how you can join us. Um, so these are some options for you. Um, all of this is based on the course, but I can tell you that each one of those, I already know that there's some team somewhere that is doing this. So. Uh, you can take everything that we've done, all the resources and materials. You don't even have to inform us. You can do this on your own. Uh, take everything that we've done and try to uh, run this. I know that some have tried and ran into some uh, issues. If you have some issues, I can help you with giving you some tips on how we solve many of these issues because we've been running this for three years now. So uh, there's lots of things that we tackled you know, in the first uh, two years and now third year, like things are so much easier. Um, one thing that you can do, let's say that you don't want to, you know, a lot, a lot of complications, you can just take all the completed replications. You have all the Qualtrics, you have all the manuscript, just run this again with your lab in your own country. So let's say you want to run this in the UK, you have a participant pool. Why not just take our Qualtrics and run this on your own and then try to, the more replications that we have, uh, the, the better. Some journals like uh, you know, Chris Chambers and the Royal Society of Open Science Metapsychology are committed to publishing replications. So just take what we've done, run this again, and then perhaps you can, you can submit this over there and, and get that accepted. Some of the teams, like for example, the Brazilians that I met earlier this year are taking our replication materials and translating this to Portuguese. So if you have a different language that you want to translate this to, that would be amazing. We would love to work with you on this sort of thing. If you don't want to run all these research projects, you just want to teach open science, you can take all our materials of open science and, and just like run this um, with your student. You're welcome to invite me for a talk in one of those things. I'm very happy to, to talk to people around the world and students. Uh, tell, me, tell me what I can do to help you do better with open science or running replications, happy to help. Um, some, some uh, even th this morning, I got uh, somebody who tried to run this um, uh, with a guided thesis student and said, but it's not working. How did you do this in, in Hong Kong University? Uh, I, can't, I can't get this to work. So I have some tips here uh, for you. I think the big three is that base yourselves on templates. So we have very good templates now. Uh, we improve them every semester. So start from templates and then in each part, you know, the students have uh, uh, instructions on what to do over there. We have very, very extensive guides. Some of them are like, you know, 50, 60 uh, pages uh, long and give them examples. At the beginning, we didn't have a lot of good examples. Now we do. So just give them examples. And with, with those big three, they'll be able to do a lot. 
but then principle of making everything open. So everything is Google Docs, everything is collaborative. We have Slack, uh, Slack channels. Um, everything that we do is documented. So when a student asks me a question first, I update the template and then I send a link to the template or I send a link to the guide. So every question that the student raises actually helps us improve something that can help the entire community. And these checks and balances about recruiting external reviewers, having peer review, teaching assistants, and then these early career researchers involving early career researchers to take the lead. I think having checks and balances is very important to, to get, things, get things done. Um, if you want to join us, I, I mentioned quite a few uh, opportunities. You can come and take the lead uh, first author on the completed replications. If you prefer to do register reports, now we have uh, 13 of those uh, completed uh, um, uh, this morning. Um, um, if you prefer to work with us on primers, guides, opinion, if you've been to SIPS, you know how that works. Everybody just works together. And then at some point we decide, okay, so now we have a draft. Um, everything that you want. So uh, if you have a new direction, I'm very happy. So at the beginning, I wasn't even thinking of prediction markets, but uh, in one of the conferences that I attended, somebody said, you're running all of this. Can we do something with it? And I'm, yes, of course, very happy to. So that kind of wraps up everything. Uh, almost everything that I mentioned uh, in this talk um, was one link that you can use. And it's this link over here. You can scan this. Uh, everything, all the resources, all of our team, all the preprints and the publications, um, everything about this project is in this link. Uh, if something is missing, if you're not sure, there's a lot of information. So sometimes it's hard to find stuff. You're very welcome to contact me. And uh, we have a mailing list that updates people about the workshop that we have, the templates that are out. Um, so you're, you're welcome to subscribe to this. I think those of you who know me from Twitter know that I'm very active on Twitter. I really try and open everything up. Everything that we do, I, I, I tweet and I invite people to come and join us so you can engage me uh, over there. And of course, my email is uh, open. So uh, if you're running into issues, if you want to collaborate, if you want some extra information, uh, very happy to uh, talk to you. So that's about it. Thank you very much.